Okay, um, I believe today's lecture was requested for specifically gearing toward the uh, intermolecular forces, according to uh, the professor. So we are going to continue on with that. Okay, so <coughs> previously we learned about intramolecular bonding, right? So intra has to do with what? Between atom to atom, right? In this category, we are talking about ionic bond number two, covalent bond and number three was the metallic bond. All right. So ionic bond was what? Basically between <coughs> metal to the metal. Right, the covalent bond was generally mostly no metal to no metal. Metallic bond is of course metal to metal. Okay, so these are connections between uh, atom to atom. Okay, when we have an atom with another atom coming together, what does it form? It forms a molecule. Right. So when we talk about molecule, we have a, a lumps of a al atoms and another lumps of atoms. And this one whole thing has an attraction force or repelling force. This force is going to be intermolecular forces. Okay. This intermolecular force is actually pretty big section when it comes to chemistry. If you have a pretty good understanding of a intra intermolecular force, I can boldly say that you have a 50% understanding of chemistry. Okay, and this is a very, very deep topic because everything connects with this. And um, how this connects with our topic that we're going to go in, in um, and it was actually, was a uh, solubility and we were talking about polarity and whatnot, right? <coughs> so starting from here, intermolecular forces, what we need to understand uh, that we briefly actually discu uh, discussed about it is a electronegativity. Okay, electronegativity is a, a uh, little trend in a periodic table Okay, this is our periodic table. And uh, excluding this section, which is novel gases. Okay, so here is a uh, helium, neon, and so on, a xenon and whatnot. Okay, we do, we do not include that. <coughs> Starting from left lower corner, which is francium, Fr, and then all the way to the fluorine at the right upper corner. Electronegativity trend goes from the weakest to the strongest. So here's a weak and strong, okay? So what does it mean by electronegativity? It's a uh, easy way to kind of um, implement this is that uh, electronegativity can be explained as how, how an ele uh, element or an atom is willing to pull away electron from its neighbor, okay? So if you have a one atom here and if you have another atom here, when they make a bond, remember make, make they are making bond by sharing of electrons, right? Okay, so we have an electron that spins around here and then spins around here, and they combine together as a one whole like loop of electrons. Okay. So because now you have a let's just say this side has stronger electronegativity. Okay, so this is strong electronegativity compared to that. This one is weak electronegativity okay so what was the one what was the electronegativity once again there's a willingness to pull away electron from the neighbor right so because this atom has a stronger electronegativity which means pulling electron away from the neighbor what will happen is it will have a unequal unequally shared electrons 
small, which is side you think. Of course, stronger side, right? So if I were to exaggerate this loop of sharing of electrons, where the electrons are traveling around, I will say it looks look like uh, maybe I should have a better color than that. Something that's more distinguishable. Oh, maybe that. Okay, it will look like this. Okay, so you have this kind of unequally shared electron uh, traveling in terms of um, little orbitals. Okay, so you see this side has more, I guess, uh, uh, area of where electrons be staying compared to that side is. So because electrons are more geared toward this side, it tends to have a partially, partial, this is a uh, um, Greek letter of a delta, a little kind of unfinished eight looking thing, okay? Partial negative charge exists there. And because electrons are more withdrawn to the uh, this side, compared to the other side, because electrons are withdrawn away from this side, it tends to have a partial positive charge. charge. Okay, so this gives you a kind of unequally shared electron showing a partially negative and positive of characteristic. This is quite stationary. Okay, and this leads into our topic goes into how our intermolecular forces are, are forming. Okay, yep, we have another student coming in. Okay, so. Let's actually kind of start going into this now. Uh, let me get rid of this electronegativity part. Okay, so keep that in mind: electronegativity and unequal shared electrons causing a uh, unbalanced sharing electron causing positive, negative, or partial charges. Okay, so first intermolecular force we're going to discuss is hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond occurs between anything that has a um, hydrogen in neighboring either F or O or N. So fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen. Okay. So, and this hydrogen bonding with one of these also has to neighbor with F O Ns. Okay, I'll sh show you example what it is, but let's kind of go into why F O Ns. Okay, let's kind of go into a periodic table one more time. Okay, excluding that noble gas section. Okay, here on the top here is B C N O F. Okay, and F O N is a uh, top right upper corner of it. Remember how we have electronegativity going from francium to fluorine, the strength goes from the weak to the strongest. Okay. So francium up stronger. From here to the right is stronger. Okay. One thing we have to notice is that the hydrogen, which stays here, the electronegativity strength of hydrogen actually sits right between boron and uh, carbon. Only reason the hydrogen is here is because what? Remember that it has a positive one charge characteristic even though it's a non-metal, right? Okay, that's only one reason. So, once again, hydrogen sits in here, but actual position of the electronegativity is between boron and carbon. Okay. So now that we know these three are one of the strongest top three electronegativity elements of the whole periodic table, and relating to the hydrogen. So let's kind of look, take a look at that. So when we're looking at water, okay, water looks like this, right? Oxygen, which is, stays here, and we're relating to hydrogen. So you can already imagine, oxygen is more electronegative compared to hydrogen is, therefore oxygen will have a what? Higher electronegativity, which pulls away electrons, right? From the hydrogen. So it will have an unbalanced electron cloud Looking like that, and also coming from this uh, the other side too. Okay, so this has a, a partially negative side on this auction side, and partially positive here. Right. Okay. 
now we have a hydrogen that is connected with oxygen okay which is this part now we have to uh, consider the neighboring of that hydrogen which is another molecule remember this is intermolecular forces was what between molecule to molecule right okay so let's have a, another water drawn there okay once again we will have a partial negative side and partial positive side just like what it was earlier right so we have a permanent magnet like happening here right partial negative always on this side partial positive on this side negative and positive so what does positive and negative do when they come together they attract so there is a force between these two let me erase this a little bit here and then move away partial and positive okay so this partial positive area and partial negative area will have attraction forces between two okay so once again this hydrogen is connected to the oxygen which is one of the FONs and the neighboring of that is also part of the FONs right so this bonding here is called hydrogen bond Give another example. Hey, how about other F and Ns? Of course. Hey, if you have a molecule which is HF, uh, hydrofluoric acid, compared to hydrogen to the fluorine, fluorine has a high electronegativity, right? Compared to hydrogen is, therefore it will also have a what? Unequal shear of electrons. Okay, so we'll have a partial negative here, partial positive here, and what do you think is going to happen between these two? They're going to come together as another hydrogen bond okay once again this hydrogen has a connection with the oxygen one of the FONs and then the neighboring of that is another FONs right that's a criteria for us to have a hydrogen bond nothing more nothing less okay let's give you an example of a nitrogen too okay we have a nitrogen give a ammonia as an example okay uh, maybe I should draw the same way Okay, nitrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen, and hydrogen. Okay, once again, nitrogen has a high electronegative than the hydrogen where it's supposed to be sitting here, right? So it goes like that, that, and also that, causing that partially negative here. Partial positive, partial positive, partial positive. Okay, so this partial negative with this partial positive will have a attraction forces. Okay, once again, this hydrogen has a connection with oxygen, one of the FONs, and the neighboring of that is also part of the FONs, right? Hydrogen bond. And you could have it for this this one too. We have partial positive here. And partial negative here. So this hydrogen is one of the FON is connected. Also, neighboring is one of the FONs. Okay, so all these are intermolecular forces considered as a hydrogen bond. Okay. Let's give another example. How about this? Okay. We are looking at carbon versus hydrogen now. Okay, carbon is still higher electronegative compared to hydrogen is. So you will have what? Still unbalanced uh, uh, share of electrons, right? <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So you know that central carbon will be having a what? Partially negative charge, and all the outer side of a Hydrogen will have partial, partial positive. So, this partial positive and this partial negative would there be attraction? Let me go with a different color now. Well, let's consider it. Okay, we have a negative and positive. Well, they will attract for sure, right? But is it a hydrogen bond? 
That's our question. So this oxygen, oh, this hydrogen, has a neighboring of a carbon, okay, connected with the carbon, right? And then, but it has a neighboring of oxygen. Well, this part meets where the neighboring of oxygen is hydrogen, right? But another part, the second part, where this carbon is not part of FON. So that means this connection is not hydrogen bond. So if you were to kind of compare, right, between twos. So carbon, uh, hydrogen with fluorine probably had the, has the most biggest difference of a electronegativity compared to hydrogen with oxygen, hydrogen with nitrogen, hydrogen with carbon, right? Because this is most far away from the corner. Okay, so that means as hydrogen is bonded with the fluorine and then to the oxygen, to the nitrogen and carbon, the electronegativity difference will start to decrease a little bit. Okay. So you can already see probably between hydrogen and fluorine will have the most polar differences, right? Because fluorine is one of the biggest, well, it is the highest electronegativity. And then the oxygen comes in after and then nitrogen comes after, right? So probably if we were to kind of rank it to the top three, this would be probably the number one strongest between electro electronegativity difference between hydrogen and fluorine, and number two, and number three, right? The differences of the electronegativities, okay? Coming from here, here, and then here, here. Now, we are talking about carbon here. Now, it's just even weaker. And we do not consider that as a hydrogen bond at all, because it's weaker than that. Well, there's an attraction force between two, but what do we call this? Okay, that's our next topic. Number two, dipole. Okay, some textbooks say dipole, dipole. Some textbooks say dipole moment. It, it's the same thing. But if it says dipole, it is dipole. Okay. All right. So anything that is not FON with hydrogen, it's considered dipole. Okay, so we already have an example here already, right? So weaker intermolecular forces, well, e weaker um, um, neg electronegativity molecules with another weaker electronegativity molecules. And it also it does not have a hydrogen with it. Okay, we will consider it as a dipole. Still, unequally share of electron because of what? Electronegativity. Okay, another example I can give you is a... Um, Carbon monoxide. Okay. Where oxygen is high electronegative compared to carbon is, right? So we can see already that, already say that oxygen will have a higher electronegative, therefore, right? We join electrons that way, right? More toward that side. So partially negative here, partially positive here. If you have another carbon monoxide, next to it that will also have a partial negative on the oxygen side, partial positive on this side, right? And that gives the attraction forces right there. It does not involve with anything with the hydrogen, but there is a polarity. So that means it's probably going to be weaker than the hydrogen bond. So you consider it as a part of dipole. Okay. All right. We have a third category. And that has to do with London dispersion force. Mm, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So sometimes people call it as LDF, right? LDF. Okay, so we have LDF all around us. What does that mean? Whether you know it or not, we use LDF on a daily basis, especially when you have what? Those uh, uh, Velcros. So usually when you get Velcros, like in your shoes, it has a little, you know, 
sticky parts. Uh, of, it looks like a fiber, but it kind of sticks to your other side, a rough surface, the smooth surface, right? So if you actually look at it, the actual one of the mechanisms how they stick together is there is a loop section, which is kind of really rough side. Uh, and no, it's more of a uh, uh, smooth side. And it's a hook section. Okay. So when they come together, this hook is kind of clinging on to that loops and that's how they stick. However, these are made out of fibers. Okay, and then fibers has a lot of carbon and hydrogen network, meaning that these are carbons connect with all the bondings, which is covalent bonds, and has a lot of hydrogens around it, generally speaking. Okay, I mean, this uh, fibers are more than hydrogens, but I'm, I'm going to make it simply in this in that fashion. Okay, bunch of hydrogens around it. And the neighboring of that also has the same structure. Bunch of hydrogens around it with the carbons. All the way around. Okay. So what we actually have here is something called London dispersion force. What it means is though each individually connection between hydrogen to this neighboring hydrogen is very weak. Already, you can already see the carbon is electronegative higher than hydrogen is. But the time time, what happens is the electrons that spins around. So let me actually give you a, a, a example of this. It goes a little differently. And let's kind of go back to this one. Okay, so let's take a look at a, um, uh, you probably heard of a uh, dipping dots, those ice creams. Right, and when they make ice cream, what do they do? This has a flume of smoke when they open this uh, canister, and then they dip a whole, bun whole bunch of different flavors of syrups in there, and you it comes out as a what ice cream, right? Basically, what it is is that <coughs> they're using liquid nitrogen. So nitrogen, if you look at it, is this structure, okay? The, even though nitrogen is a pretty high electronegative, but they are sharing electron between two nitrogens, right? So their electrons sharing is pretty much equal to each other. So the loops are pretty uniform. As a, so in, in terms of as a gas state, which in room temperature, they don't really have attraction forces between two. Okay, so, so this is the N2 gases, just like O2 that we breathe in and out. Okay. But the temperature as drops, I think these freezes uh, becomes liquefied somewhere around like I think negative 100, 180 degrees Celsius, some sort. Very, very cold temperature. I'm not too sure. Let me let me actually double check the temperature because I don't want to give you guys wrong information as a teacher. <laughs> okay, so nitrogen. Uh, So yeah, it is, oh, pretty close. One, negative 195, well, not pretty close, but it is close enough. 195 degrees Celsius. 95 degrees Celsius, okay. Still very cold. So starting from this point, the, a, the uh, molecule, nitrogen molecule, will start stick together. Well, teacher, you just told me that they have equal share of electrons and there's no polarity. How are they gonna stick together? Because of temperature. Okay. What happens is, I, I think we talked about this before. Kinetic energy is proportional to what? Temperature, right? So as temperature drops, our kinetic energy, which is what? Moving energy drops too. So it doesn't always affect the el element itself, but also affect the movement of electron too. So let's say this electron at the room temperature, electron was speeding around at speed of speed of light, okay, which is 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Okay, this is very fast. How fast is this? This is as fast as if you are having a uh, uh, having you traveling, circling around the Earth seven and a half times in one second. That's how fast this is. Okay, and you're dropping a temperature significantly low. 
and the speed of this electron sh spinning drops. Okay, so you have a electron that spins around. Now it's going slower, and so is this neighboring one too. So when the time comes to the point where electron is spinning to that direction, to that point, at that significant moment when they slow down, you have a lesser amount of electron sitting in here than the other side is. So that that instant moment, you will have a partially negative here. And because the electrons are away from this side, this side is partially positive. And if the neighbor also happened to be having the same effect of electron was here and then traveling on that side, so now you will have a partial negative here, partial positive here. At that moment, there is going to be a connection between two. But remember, they are not frozen. These electrons are not completely frozen. It still spins around. So when the time comes again, an electron moves, and then the electron moves to here, now then this side starts becoming partially negative, and that side is going to be partially positive. That repels the electron also toward the other side, making this side negative, that side positive. And that moment is another bonding between two. And well, this is not stable. But so that means this positive and negative, positive and negative will all switch back and forth. And whenever there is a moment where the positive and negatives are facing each other from molecule to molecule, that's where that bonding comes. And it's bonding enough to form a liquefied nitrogen at this temperature or below. Okay. So this force, attraction force, the temporary force that comes between two, I mean, it could be temporary as long as the temperature is low enough, then it's going to be a little more permanent, right? So that's why it's a liquid. So this bonding is called LDF. Okay. So let's go kind of go back to this topic again. Velcro. So they, you were, we just talked about here earlier that this negative side is going to be more of a carbon side because electron negative is higher on the carbon side than the hydrogen is, right? Which is partially positive. Partially negative here, partially positive here. But how do they form a bond? Remember, electrons are shared between two, but also when electron, let's say, one of the electron was, let's be more specific, electron that was here, it moved away making this side a little more negative, make things more positive. Let's just say this electron that was here is moved toward that direction, making this side a little bit more, maybe I get maybe less of a positive because the electron is moving this way. And then moves away and this side more negative, right? So this also has a little pulsating of a negative positive going on, a little more pulsating and doing positive here. And that is a moment where that things are away and it has a little attraction force between two. And these are temporary forces because we're not talking about what? This temperature, right? In fact, of room temperature. But that is sufficient enough for them to have a LDF between two. All the fibers tend to have this with this, this type of loop and hook connection in, t in terms of Velcros. So it's not just a loop and hook that hooks into together, but this fiber is having a intermolecular forces of a LDF causing more attraction forces on top of it. So how can we tell this? Later on after this lecture, find a Velcro at home and just pull it out as it is dried. Okay. Okay. If you try to feel that force, okay, how much force is needed for your hand, you know, with your hand to pull that away. Now what you want to do is wet the whole entire Velcro and try to pull it away. And you can probably feel that it's a little bit easier to pull away when it's wet compared to when it's dry. Why? Because water prevents this intermolecular forces between two. So only mechanism that holds between, between the loop and hook, hook and loop in terms of Velcro is only this literally close to that loop and hook, hook and loop. Okay, so this LDF is kind of died out at that moment until that water is dried and then this LDF comes back again. Okay, try to fill that later on and see what the difference is. Okay. So even though it's a very, very weak force and very, very conditional, especially when it comes to nitrogen, nitrogen, 
because the small forces added up so many layers of it, it gives you pretty strong uh, interaction, uh, intermolecular forces as uh, all together. You've probably seen a lot of uh, frogs, or especially geckos, uh, those lizards, sticking to the wall. Like, they could literally walk on the ceiling, right? How do they do that? They don't ha really have a suction cup on their foot. What they have is on their foot, they have a bunch of fibers that creates this LDF on the surface, and they can stick any surfaces. Okay, so that's how LDF can be pretty strong, even though the each LDF is very weak. Okay, so these are the basis of how we are under, uh, uh, understanding of uh, intermolecular forces. Okay, of course there are more to this, and 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 I'm actually going as a strong to weaker. There are actually stronger intermolecular force than the hydrogen bond, and that's we're gonna uh, discuss this one too. Okay, let's get rid of that. What is stronger hydrogen bond than uh, uh, what is a stronger intermolecular force than hydrogen bond? Remember, hydrogen bond is what between partial negative and partial positive, right? Stronger would be something more than partial positives or partial negatives. So that's when we kind of go back to our solubility stuff. Okay, we have NaCl, salt dissolving water. What happens to salt dissolving water? It becomes Na plus and Cl minus, right? It dissolves in such a way as an ion. This is a full charge of uh, uh, um, a charge of a positive charge and full charge of negative charges here. Okay. But remember, when they dissolve in water, how come they don't stick together? We discussed about this last week, right? Because why? Water once again, has a partially negative, partially positive area, right? So oxygen side negative, hydrogen side positive. So oxygen side will come toward the sodium, stabilizing that positive charge all the way around. So this tip part is always oxygen is okay. So there is a. So if I were to draw individually, we have a partial negative here. Connecting with what? Well, I don't want to say connected. Attracted to the full positive. So we have a partial to the full interactions. Qu going to that chlorine, we have a hydrogen here, which is partial negative side and a full negative, oh, no, partial positive side and a full negative side coming as interaction forces. Okay, so this is full charge versus partial charge. Once again, full charge versus partial charge. In hydrogen bond, it's a partial with a partial. So you can already see, full with a partial will be stronger than the partial with the partial. Kind of makes sense, right? So this is stronger than hydrogen bond. Okay. What do we call this? Did we call this ion dipole? Well, it doesn't sound like this, but actually it's this. So Remember how we have a similarity of a dipole going on here? Polarity of a positive, a negative and positive. Polarity of negative and positive here because of electronegativity. Okay, so hydrogen bond can be a part of a dipole. It's just that it's the strongest of the top three. Okay. Now everyone gets an A in the class, but that does not mean everyone gets a Valerie Victorian, right? As when you guys graduate. Some people will have a little more recognized than the others are, right? So kind of think of it that way. Okay. So as a whole bigger picture, yes, hydrogen bond can be a dipole. It's just that they are a little more distinctive than the dipole is, so that they are stronger. So we call that, once again, what? Ion dipole interactions. Sometimes people say ion dipole um, uh, bond or ion dipole interaction doesn't really matter. Okay, so it's the ion with the dipole. Ion with the dipole. Okay. So the connection between two once again is what? Solubility. How does solubility works? The one of the slogan that we talked about was what? Like dissolves like. Right? Let's say how that applies to our water. Dissolving salt. NaCl. Oops, uh, Cl, right? These are 
quite polar molecule where it actually has a positive side and a negative side compared to water once again having a partially negative side and partially positive side so this is a polar molecule and that's a polar molecule therefore like dissolves like okay and coming to that if you compare to let's just say water with a some kind of a um, uh, nonpolar compound for instance of what uh, co2 okay let's just draw that out too, actually okay so let's kind of go back a little bit study this in closer okay when we are looking at b c n o f we have a polarity between carbon and oxygen right oxygen's high electron negative compared to carbon is right so we'll be withdrawn toward the oxygen so you can see that this will happen right electron electron clouds are more toward the oxygen okay why is this not polar molecule but non-polar well let's take a look we have a oxygen having a partially negative partially positive in the middle partial negative here so the negativity goes from where from this side to that direction and from this side to that directions okay we are having a tug of war opposite directions with the same forces okay that cancels out the whole entire polarity okay so when it comes to shape so this also connects to what Lewis structure that's why Lewis structure is very important so if you know how to draw the structure a certain way and not making a drawing like this right, CO2 and you know that it's not this shape but it's this shape you can already see okay you know what the forces are going opposite they equal each other they cancel each other therefore making this compound as what nonpolar compound oops non polar compound where this one remember why are we drawing hydrogen and uh, water as a bent shape once again oxygen has what two lone pair electron that sits around it causing this to bond within oxygen hydrogen will kind of push down toward down right causing this bent shape okay that's why we can have a sustained novel partial negative here partial positive here okay making it one sided negative one sided positive so this is polar well this is not like dissolves like right this none likes that's why they don't mix each other so when you open up a coke or any bubbly sodas as soon as you open up you, you make pssst. noise comes out what is that coming out the co2 and if you leave it out enough what happens your coke gets flat what does it mean co2 that was compressed into the solution dissolved meaning compressed into the solution it was kind of dissolved it goes away it, it evaporates well you know, I guess undissolves away from uh, liquid right because they are not really meant to be together because nonpolar to polar so solubility is very low when it comes to polar to nonpolar okay so this is how solubility connects with this topic again right like I said earlier if you understand these three and these threes maybe this one too and it connects with so many different chapters and it, it makes your life a whole lot easier if you have an understanding of this because this also connects us to later on uh, probably maybe next week you guys are going to talk about I heard that you guys to start talking about the um, acid and base and it has a lot to do with this too okay, and it has a bunch of connections that has to do with intermolecular forces okay so this bonds is connecting to the solubility as we just saw okay any specific questions so far I know I might have gone a little too quick okay if not we're gonna continue a little bit further let me double check because I know there's another topic that uh, your professor wanted to cover beside the solubility part uh oh 
Okay, yeah. I'm going to actually go into a asset and base on top of this. Okay. So, asset and base. Can be pretty easy, but could be pretty difficult depending on how you <laughs> perceive it. But let's take a look. Okay, so there are three types of assets and bases. Okay. So, first one is Arrhenius. SID as in base. Okay. Yep, hold on a second. Give me a second. Okay, sorry about that. All right. Okay, asset and base. Okay, so first thing is Arrhenius asset and base. Arrhenius asset base, the example of that would be um, HCL with NaOH. So here, in terms of a definition of Arrhenius asset, is acid donates hydrogen ion okay base donates hydroxide ion okay so we have a hydrochloric acid which will be donating this hydrogen and we have sodium hydroxide which will be donating this uh, hydroxide okay so what happens is this will come together as a NaCl plus HOH. Remember this when we were doing the reaction predictions or um, type of bonds, uh, type of reactions that we were talking about, HOH comes into what? H2O. Okay, so basically, remember that uh, double repressive reaction, kind of similar to this. A, B, C, D becomes what? Uh, a D plus C B and is uh, A D is the hydrogen and hydroxide, which is going to be this one, and C B is sodium chloride, which is going to be that one. Okay, so kind of similar formats of a double crystal reactions, but specifically we call this also call this a neutralizing reaction. Because basically what, we're, what we are doing is acid with a base, we are neutralizing into a what? Water, basically. Okay. And the byproduct is a salt. Well, the, remember the salt, it says LT, not TL, LT, as a what? Because be, it, it could have been potassium hydroxide instead of sodium chloride, sodium, you know, sodium, right? So that means it's going to be K if you were to put a start at the K, well, which will do the same reaction. So we call that quote unquote a salt, not really NaCl as a salt, but general term of a ionic compound as a salt. Okay, so this is Arrhenius acid and base. Okay, donating hydrogen ion and donating hydroxide ion. Okay, all right, next one is Bronsted. Oops, R, uh, let me rewrite that. And Lari acid and base. Okay, this one's a little bit more tricky. So uh, let's kind of look at, uh, I guess, a strong example. Okay, so for the bronze acid, oops, 
acid with donis electrons, same thing as the uh, Arrhenius. Oh, my electrons are uh, hydrogen, okay, hydrogen ion. Base accepts that hydrogen. Okay, so what happens here is this H plus will donate to that, and this uh, water will accept that. So what forms is a Cl minus plus H3O plus. Okay, so he's acting as a donor, he's acting as a acceptor. Right. So this brings a pretty interesting topic of a conjugate acid and conjugate base. What does that mean? Okay, so remember this is an acid. This is a base. Okay, this acid became what? Chlorine, right? HCl became HCl, uh, HCl minus by giving off. So we call this conjugate. Base, and we call hydrogen, oh, uh, number water accepted the hydrogen became what? Conjugate acid. What does that mean? As acid gives off that hydrogen, it loses that acidic power. So it becomes a base. Because why? If you were to have this reaction going reverse, we could actually, well, not entirely, but actual reaction-wise, but as as a, as an example-wise, one of the hydrogen can be given off to that, forming that HCl plus H2O again. Well, this is not really that sustainable uh, in terms of a reaction because this uh, the acidic acidity of the HCl is very strong, and the whole idea of HCl is being being a strong acid because he does not want to have the hydrogen, and he wants to release that hydrogen. And we're going to go briefly into that uh, toward the end of the today's class in terms of strength of the acidity. Okay, so now at this time, this is acting as an acid because it donated the hydrogen and this accepted that hi uh, hydrogen, right? So this is the base. So this uh, acid becomes what? Conjugate base. Oops. Conjugate base. Where this base became what? Conjugate acid. Conjugate, conjugate acid, right? Kind of similar to this way, okay? So that's a little bit different compared to the Arrhenius acid. Number three, Lewis acid and base. Oops. Okay, Lewis acid base is a little bit different characters than others are. Um, acid will accept electron. Base will donate electron. Okay, so one other good example is So this is boron trihydride. This is ammonia with the lone pair. So what happens here is the electron that is in lone pair in a nitrogen will be given to that boron, forming into a structure look like this. So what happened here? We have an electron donor, which is what? Base. Electron acceptor, which is an acid. Oops, why do I keep writing C instead of A? Okay, so we have an acid and base relationship here by transferring electron to the boron and form a bond like this. Okay, so there is no conjugates here. There's, this is one thing. 
this transfer of electron leads into, I'm not sure if you guys go into it, but this is going to be into a electrochemistry. This is the D last chapter generally in the whole entire chemistry and very important as we are facing our electric cars and whatnot. Pretty big industry. Okay, so these are three general types of acid and bases. Okay, and this later on leads into a whole bunch of the idea of uh, what? Um, calculating pHs and whatnot. Okay, so let's kind of roll back to that the topic that we're going to talk about that, about strong acid and you know, weak acid and whatnot. How does that occur? So when we generally look at strong acids, oops, okay, these are top three strong acids. Okay, hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroidoic acid. If you look at the periodic table, on the right side, F C L B R I, okay, these are the right side. And then there's a B, C, N, O, F, and these are all other, you know, helium and uh, uh, neon and whatnot. Okay, so this is the right side corner. So if you look at it, these three connected with hydrogen, showing a strong acid. And then when we look at weak acid, one of the example of weak acid is actually. HF. Okay. What differentiates now from this fluorine to the, all the rest of the threes? That's our key. So that means let's kind of think about what it means by strong acid. Okay. Anything that's a strong acid. Remember what was strong acid? Well, acid wanted to do generally when it comes to Arrhenius and Bronsted. They want to what? Give out hydrogen. Okay. So if you have a high uh, uh, acid, you know, uh, very strong acid. That's just an example of HCl. What they want to do in a water is they want to have H plus and CMI. This H plus to be liberated away from chlorine. That's a whole idea. So when we are saying that oh something is acidic, something is not acidic, is amount of hydrogen ion in the solution. That's a whole idea. So when we are measuring the pH, which is the measurement of acid and uh, acidity, is by measuring amount of H plus ion dissolved in that water. So that means weak acid does not want to uh, release that hydrogen, uh, hydrogen away from that fluorine. So for example, of a weak acid, HF, H plus and Cl minus, oh, not Cl minus, Cl minus, F minus. Okay, let's say we had a hundred of these existed. Once it dissolves in water, we'll, you will find a hundred of this and a hundred of that, and this becomes zero. Okay, entirely every single one of these will be dissociated into H plus and Cl minus. When it comes to weak acid, if you had a hundred of these, Maybe you will see three of that and three of that, and this will remain as a 97 of an S remainder, remainder. Because of the connection between H and Cl and H and F, this is stronger bond between two compared to these two are, and so the rest of the, the other two, Br and I, it easily disconnects and dissociates into this form compared to this. So you will see less amount of H plus available to measure our pH when you're looking at the same amount of being dissolved in water. Okay, so this tells us an acidity difference. Even though you have a starting with a hundred, same hundred amount. Okay, very small amount. Same thing for bromine and iodine, HBr and HI. When you put hundred of them here it will 100% become, 100 become 100 of this and 100 of the other party. Okay, that tells us pH. So the way we calculate pH is by negative log of H plus. Okay, this bracket represents a concentration, which is the molar molarity, right? Which is what? Molarity is what? 
moles over liter, right? That's the volume <coughs> amount of H plus in a given volume. Okay, and if you put a negative log into a calculator, it will give a pH level. So in terms of acidity, pH wise, going from zero to fourteen, where zero is the most acidic, and fourteen is basic. And seven is where the neutral is, where the water sits in. Okay, so the lower in the pH number it is, more acidic it will be. Higher pH number it is, more base it will be. In opposite to this, we also have something called pOH scale, which is exactly opposite. Zero to fourteen still there, but this pOH is the opposite of it, of a, uh, a pH. So this is basic. This is acidic. And once again, seven as a neutral in the water. Okay. So this is a kind of little um, brief uh, uh, coming into a um, acid and base content that probably you guys are gonna go into in next uh, next uh, week. Okay. I mean, like uh, this is only very surface of acid and base, but we are running out of time. So I don't think we can cover any more than, than this, um, but we'll get to, if we have time next week. Uh, oh, uh, you know what, actually, next week is actually, um, we are doing a uh, uh, presentation, well, actually, I'm doing a presentation for what kind of nurse life is like. I think that's what I heard. So um, I am going to have a very brief, how my experience and how my career was in the nursing. And um, probably more than half of a uh, whole session is going to be a Q&A sessions of uh, what is it like or whatever question that you guys may have uh, in terms of a uh, career in a nursing. So we're going to discuss about that next week. And I don't think we're doing a lecture next week, so just be aware on that part. Okay. So um, any other questions, let me know. Uh, we have like I think three minutes left right now. Uh, Google is actually giving a countdown right now. It's like three minutes left. Any questions? All good, I guess. Okay. If not, we'll end here. As um, uh, I don't think um. There is much I can actually add on top of this with this short time that we have left. So uh, I guess um, I'll talk to you guys next week. And um, yeah, let me know if there's any questions. Like I said, always leave the comment to the uh, uh, Discord channel if you have any specific question we'll go over. Okay, all right. Have a good week, weekend, guys, and um, see you guys next week. <coughs>